Welcome back. We're on deck. This is our first digital version of on deck. This is so exciting. Law Hub and you together again. All right. So we're working on. Uh, this is prep test 87, section 2. So now we're in the Law Hub sections. And we're going to begin here with question number six in logical reasoning. Uh, <clears throat> the issue presented uh, is which of the following, if true, most helps justify the application of the principle? All righty. So we're going to read about a principle. We're going to read about an application of the principle. And then we're going to attempt to justify the application. And what do we have here? The principle. If someone makes an error, it is unethical for a co-worker to use that error to his or her own advantage. Couldn't be any clearer than that. Ah, perhaps not. Okay, so I have the principle. If someone makes an error, it's unethical for a co-worker to use that error to his or her own advantage. And here's the application. Because Mark, which is an example, because Mark used his co-worker Rashimi's client email addresses to advance his own career, his action was unethical. So, the application of this is that Mark has behaved in an unethical manner, and according to our principle, it's unethical for a co-worker to use an error to his or her advantage. So, it has to be the case that Rashimi made an error here, and that uh, Mark use that error to his own advantage. Okay, let's see what we have here. So, choice A. Mark had the email addresses of Rashimi's clients only because he had copied them from Rashimi's directory while she was at lunch. Um, so I don't see an error there. I don't see Rashimi making an error. And uh, it all depends what the word error means, go figure. Uh, you know, because you could read into this and say, well, you know, she made, uh, 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 you know, the, <clears throat> she made an error by uh, leaving the, but no, there's no evidence here that she made an error. So, uh, A is not the answer. B, a co-worker of Rashimi and Mark's had access to Rashimi's client email addresses and shared them with Mark. Well, again, uh, I don't see any error there um, on the... Uh, part of Rashimi. That the co-worker did it, there was no error there. C. Rashimi offered to help Mark develop a client base by sharing her own client's emails, uh, email addresses with him. Well, you know, you could consider that an error. It was an error in judgment, perhaps. Um, but the, it, is that really an error? Is that, it, you know, so you'd have to keep reading, but this certainly is a case where it really all depends on what the word error means. Uh, let's look at D. D. Mark had access to Rashimi's client email addresses only because she unintentionally left them visible in an email that she had sent to both Mark and her clients. Well, when you do something unintentionally, it is erroneous, meaning it was not intentionally, it was an error. So there's an error in here. And we'll read E, uh, but there's an error. And E says, Mark happened upon a list, happened upon a list of the email addresses of Rashimi's client while conducting market research. That does not sound like an error on Rashimi's behalf. Um, laws, if I haven't mentioned the word textually, uh, let me mention the word textually. Laws about interpretation of language and words. And this really has everything to do with what constitutes an error. You would need to read all five choices here. And the answer choice is certainly going to be D, because that you know, omission here is the most analogous thing we have to an error. So six is D for Drusus. Seven. Seven is a flaw. Sabine's argument is most vulnerable to criticism on the grounds that, OK. Well, I have Kevin and then I have Sabine, and Sabine engages in a flaw. Let me see if I can pick up what that is. Kevin, my barber shop sells a herbal supplement that, according to my barber, helps prevent baldness. Should have only have known. Because it contains an enzyme that blocks the formation of a chemical compound that causes people to lose hair. 
So let's stop. Let's get what Kevin says. Kevin says, my barber uh, shop sells an herbal supplement that, according to the barber, not according to Kevin, right? According to the barber, helps prevent baldness because it contains an enzyme that blocks the formation of a chemical compound that causes people to lose hair. Got it. Sabine, that's simply not true. Well, that's Sabine's conclusion, so I need some reasoning. That's simply not true. You know, the fact is, your barber makes money by convincing people to buy that product. So, this is a very common flaw. Uh, that's, not a, uh, that's not a persuasive argument on Sabine's part. Uh, the mere fact that the barber makes money. And again, all this work is done. I haven't looked at an answer choice. This all is done in advance, right? And you're saying, you know, the flaw in this is you're discounting what the barber says because the barber has skin in the game, right? The barber may stand to benefit from that. That doesn't mean that the advice the barber is about to give is, is not valid. Okay, so I'm just looking for that. A is the error, is the uh, flaw, I'm sorry, is the flaw that Sabine discounts scientifically plausible evidence merely because the person offering it is not a scientist. Uh, I don't know where the scientifically plausible evidence came in here, but uh, no, A is not the answer. B, does Sabine take for granted, which means assumes, that a product will be harmful if it is sold on the basis of an unsubstantiated claim? No, what she's saying is reject out of hand anything that the barber says because the barber has an interest in the outcome. C. Does Sabine reject an explanation without proposing an alternative explanation? Well, you know, you can defeat the reasoning of an argument on its own. You don't have to propose alternative reasoning. You can certainly point out that this reasoning is flawed, and so that's not it. D. Does Sabine draw a conclusion about someone's motives for making a particular claim without providing evidence that any such claim was made. Well, you know, it's a great start to that, but it's like really stupid at the end because actually the claim was made. Barbara did make the claim, so, but, no. And E, does Sabine reject a claim merely because the person making the claim stands to benefit by doing so? Duh. So, the answer to uh, number seven is E for Euphrates. Question number eight. Which one of the following principles, uh, if valid, most strongly supports the analyst's reasoning? Okay, so I'm going to get reasoning, which is going to be particular, or particularized, and then I'm going to have a general principle, which is going to validate the reasoning. Okay, and here it comes. Analyst. When Johnson attacked his opponent by quoting her out of context, his campaign defended this attack by claiming that the quote was even more politically damaging to her in context. Again, if you need to reread it, you got to, this is the law. This is Iraq. So, okay, that first sentence tells me that, as a fact, Johnson attacks his opponent by quoting her out of context. But then his campaign turns around and says, you know what, it wasn't unfair. Uh, <clears throat> because if you put it in context, it was even more damaging. Got it. Next sentence. But those who run his campaign clearly do not believe this. Okay, tell me why. They have since had plenty of chances to refer to the quote in its proper context, but continue to quote it out of context. All right, I got it. So we want to elevate this up to a broader level uh, where there's, a, there's an agenda here that's not expressed that really is, a, you know, basically this has to do now with what, do you, what, what are you going to do in a campaign when you want to get elected? Um, and, uh, you know, here it's going to be, well, you're going to pretty much do what's going to promote your election. So I don't have the answer. I don't have the words. Uh, but let's look at the answer choice. And again, think of Iraq as a sword and a shield. And the sword is when you produce the outcome. You just have it. You know, and you look at the answer choice and say, son of a bitch. That's what I thought of. That's the sword. Lop off the head. The shield is you've acquired enough information and you've done sufficient analysis so that you fend off, just fend off choices that don't reflect the general thoughts that you've developed. Okay. So, A, uh, which one of the following most strongly supports the analyst's reason? Principle. 
And here's the principle to Nay. In criticizing an opponent, political campaigns will pursue the line of attack they believe to be the most politically damaging. Sounds good to me. Now, I will keep reading. But that absolutely sounds good to me. Um, I want to keep reading, but it's close to a sword. Close to a sword. But let me use that as a shield for B, C, D, and E, if I'm right. B. In criticizing an opponent, political campaigns do not use techniques that they would find objectionable if used against their candidate. You know, it, it, it seems to me the only way you can pick B is by rushing your read and not understanding what the writer wrote, because clearly that's not the answer. This is the, the opposite of where we're going. C, in criticizing an opponent, political campaigns are expected by voters to make sure that the quotes to which these campaigns refer are not taken out of context. What in God's name does that have to do with this argument? The voters are not part of this. Uh, you're bringing in information from the outside that's unrelated to the information you were given, and C is not the answer. This, 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 the principle here is I'm going to do what's going to serve my campaign to win. D, in criticizing an opponent, political campaigns will not be strongly criticized as long as the words attributed to their opponent were actually said by their opponent. Well, again, that may be true like in a real life situation or something, but that's not the principle here. You know, A looks look more and more like the answer. And E, in criticizing an opponent, political campaigns will avoid advo I'm sorry will avoid using uh, techniques that leave their candidate open to effective counterattacks you know that's not where we are um, so the you know it, it, this has nothing to do with avoiding effective counterattacks this is I'm gonna do what I gotta do to prevail when I'm in a political campaign so the answer to number eight is April Augustus because we move right along we go to question number nine and we have on nine on the basis of their dialogue it can most reasonably reasonably be concluded that Ellen and Santiago disagree over the truth of which of the following statements so here we have what's the point at issue what do they agree about what do they disagree about in this case what do they disagree about okay Ellen a group of economists and ecologists recently estimated the economic value of Earth's biospheres, quote-unquote, essential services, such as climate regulation, food, and water supply, <clears throat> at 33 trillion annually. So we have economists and ecologists who place a monetary value on our biosphere, 33 trillion. Got it. We should therefore make protection of the biosphere a high priority. So Ellen's position, just take one at a time, Ellen's position is in that this has such a high monetary value, we should make protection of the biosphere a high priority. Okay, so, so again, the reasoning, economic value, and monetary value, and conclusion, we should protect it, we should make it a high priority. Santiago, I'm uncomfortable with the idea of calculating the biosphere dollar value in order to justify protecting it. So Santiago's agreeing we should protect it, but Santiago's taking issue with maybe that's not the reason we need to protect it. So let's see where they go. Uh, Santiago continues, such an, uh, such an approach implies that the biosphere's most important value lies in, its, in the quote-unquote services it provides to us. Okay, so Santiago's position, what they're disagreeing about, is whether or not the value ought to be expressed in dollar value. That's what they're disagreeing about, because Ellen's saying we should, and Santiago's saying we shouldn't. Okay. Uh, let's see what we have here. So, scroll my screen in this new universe that we have, and we have A. So, is, do they disagree that estimating the dollar value of the biosphere essential services is an appropriate way of providing a rationale for making protection of the biosphere a high priority. That is absolutely what they disagree about. Now, for me, this would be the sword, uh, because it's crystal clear to me in reading Santiago's conclusion that it's butting heads with Ellen's, and that's what they're butting heads about. Having said that, 
it's fine if it's not crystal clear to you you use this as a shield okay but yeah I mean just again just I don't want to run by this too quickly what they're the, the disagreement is estimating the dollar value right that 33 trillion thing of the biosphere essential services is appropriate it's not appropriate to Santiago and it is appropriate to Ellen and more specifically an appropriate way of providing a rationale the reasoning for making protection of the biosphere a high priority absolutely what they disagree about so let's keep reading uh, B uh, the biosphere's most important value lies in something other than the services it provides to human beings well I don't know that it's the most important value uh, you know, you could look at B and say, well, they maybe they disagree about that, that the biosphere's most important value, but, but that nobody's talking about the most important value. We're talking about something that's a high priority. So, you, you know, you can read into this and you can bring your real life experience into this and say there's nothing more important. You're, you know, you're all going to die because there's climate change. Well, maybe yes, maybe no. B's not the answer. C. Calculating the dollar value of the biosphere's essential services is, and here we go again, is the most effective way to ensure that protecting the biosphere is treated as a matter of urgency. There, you know, there's no evidence that they disagree that that's the most effective way. Um, Santiago's just saying that's not the way we should do it. Uh, D, the idea that the dollar value of the biosphere's essential services can be accurate, accurately calculated is unrealistic. Um, there's no evidence they disagree about that statement. There's simply no evidence they disagree about that statement. And E, calculating the dollar value of the biosphere's essential services implies that the biosphere's most important value lies in the services it provides to human beings. And I venture to guess that more than a few of you are looking at E saying, and why is that not the answer? And it's not the answer because they don't disagree about that. What they have, that, that Santiago agrees that it implies this, it, it, that if you calculate by the dollar value the essential services, right, if you do that, it implies that the biosphere most important value lies in the service it provides to human beings. They both agree it can, it, it does imply that, but Santiago's position is that's not the way to go about uh, putting value on the, on, on the biosphere. That's not, not how we should do it. So, you know, E, I think I, E's delightfully wrong. If you did pick it, congratulations. You don't get any points for it. Uh, but but you really want to sit down, look at the wording on A, look at the wording on E, and you go back here, I'll just go back to A in a moment, is A, that what they agree, disagree about is estimating the, the dollar value of the biosphere's essential services is an appropriate way. Santiago doesn't think it's an appropriate way, and Ellen does. Not that it implies that they both agree, yeah, they, yeah, yeah it implies it, it's just not appropriate. It's, it's a great task, just, just, just saying. All right, so the uh, question number nine answer is, uh, is A for Augustus, and we look at question number 10 here. We'll close it out, the segment out in question number 10. And what do we have here? Uh, which one of the following is true most effectively completes the explanation above? So I just want to file the author's reasoning and just complete it. Okay, what do I have here? Researchers have found that most people's bodies make an enzyme, and then they give me these letters, that plays a, a crucial role in eliminating uh, nicotine, the addictive drug in cigarettes, from the body. You stop. You just, just take it in. So most people create this enzyme, and this enzyme plays a role in getting nicotine out of your body. Nice enzyme. Next sentence. Smokers whose body makes the most common form of the enzyme. So now we're talking about a specific type, right? The most common form of this enzyme. So smokers whose bodies make the most common form of the enzyme tend to smoke more than those whose bodies make some other form of it. 
So if you don't smoke so much, you probably, or you may have, and I'll probably may be strong, but it's not unlikely that if you don't smoke a lot, you have lower percent of this type of enzyme. And if you do smoke a lot, you have a higher percent of this enzyme. And it's kind of odd, you know, because the enzyme plays a role in eliminating nicotine. And here we go. Why? Why is that the case? <clears throat> well, the faster nicotine is eliminated from one's body, the sooner one will crave another cigarette. And, well, and yeah, like hello. And so if I smoke a lot, then I have a higher percent of that particular, uh, I want to get the, uh, the, uh, the smokers who have the most common form. So what they're saying there is, and so, the smokers with the most common form of this enzyme, right, are getting rid of the nicotine and smoke, and that's why they smoke more, because right? they have this enzyme, it gets the nicotine out, they want the nicotine, they smoke more. So, I'm ready, again, I don't know what words they're going to use, that is the work, this is what you decidedly want to practice, this is legal reasoning, this is giving advice to a client. Okay, let me see what he says. So, and, the most common form of whatever, the enzyme, right, is the one that most rapidly eliminates nicotine from the body. And it's, for me, it's the sword. That's it. That's exactly right. I don't need to read any further. I will for the purposes of this. But that's how you would complete this argument, because you're trying to explain why do heavy smokers have the, you know, the most, why are they getting rid of the nicotine more efic efficiently, well, they're getting rid of it more efficiently because they have the most common form of the enzyme, which does precisely that. Uh, so again, A says the most common form of the enzyme is the one that rapidly eliminates nicotine from the body, and that would answer this. B, most people whose bodies make the rarest form do not smoke at all. That's sheer speculation. That's, I mean, you're really not thinking like a lawyer. I mean, you got, if you're picking B, right, you really got to sit down and say, let me stop now, because that's not this argument. This, not, this argument has almost nothing to do with the rarest form of the enzyme. C. If one's body does not make the enzyme, nicotine will still be eliminated, though very slowly. I don't have a clue. So the only way you can pick that is by bringing in stuff from the outside world. D. The greater the quantity of the enzyme that one's body makes, the faster the nicotine will be eliminated. So again, D, I like D as a wrong answer, but do you see that A referred to the most common form of it? And D did not refer to the most common form of it, and the reasoning did refer to the most common. That is reading textually. This test has almost nothing to do with academics. It's changing the way you read. E, helping to eliminate nicotine is not the only function that the enzyme serves. Who? gives a flying flip. So, the answer to number 10 is April Augustus. That was very exciting.